Um, okay. Next person, um, Asma, from, uh, who's going to be discussing accessibility. Yay, you're back. Yay. Um, amazing. We had some technical issues before, but now everyone can see your wonderful banana T-shirt. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> I'll hand you it. Okay, so I'm going to try this. And if I freeze and stop, hopefully you get the best side of me. Uh, but can someone let me know if you can't hear me and I've gone? Okay. <laughs> awesome. So I'm just going to move you to the side and get my presentation up. Um, right, to all of those who are here now, 66. Wow, awesome. It is a bit strange not being able to see you all, uh, but I'm just going to go into the flow and see how it goes. Thank you, Latifa, for your awesome presentation. You're never babbling on. It's always a lot of sense, and I learned so much from you, so thank you. So my name is Asma, and I will start by saying that I'll take your breath away. And on that note, it's not pronounced like the condition. It's actually Asma, just so you know. That's my line. That's my not my chat-up line, but that's my line. You can imagine I've, what I've had to deal with all my life. But um, I'm embracing it now. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually means many names and specifically God's many names. I love, love, love technology and I think there, is, there are so many opportunities to do so many things with it. But everything that I do in my life is very um, physical, physical human to physical human. And you'd see what I mean as I go on to share with you my uh, different areas that I'm covering on accessibility. But before I begin, I want to just thank you all for this opportunity. And um, like I said earlier, whatever happens, happens. Um, at least we're trying. And for me personally, if nothing comes out of this, I hope that isn't the case. But I'm just glad and happy that something is happening somewhere and that we're trying in this way, in this very difficult time that we are all experiencing because we're not working from home. We are working during a crisis. And so I hope on that note that you all are doing as well as you can and um, there's a full moon out and I'm a believer in moons and its effects and stuff so make sure you try and get a meditation in tonight but give you a quick bit about me because I think it's important that you know who I am and potentially if you're going to be working with me few kind of are going to be working with and the rest will come with experience I hope so I'm a lover of love and I exist to cultivate authentic inclusivity in the world I'm on a lifelong quest of discovery and the function of the soul using a human form. So I'm a very much believer of uh, the soul. I'm an independent pediatric occupational therapist who specializes in neuro and sensory integration, specifically with children. I'm also a queer Muslim woman who leads prayers at the Inclusive Mosque Initiative. Um, and I use my knowledge and experience to build bridges between faiths. I'm an expert by experience and I use my expertise to work with uh, young women in local schools who are affected by all forms of violence, more specifically gang violence. And therefore, I'm a trustee of a leading violence against women's organisation called Women and Girls Network. I was born and raised in East London, near Stratford. And um, yeah, that's all about me. Of course, I love music and love sports and all of that stuff as well, but maybe that can come afterwards. Um, so I'm covering three areas here and without kind of taking up too much space for the other speakers. And I'm sure the rest of you's got loads of things to do in your lovely evening that you have the rest of. Um, I'll start with just speaking about the OT side of things, which is occupational therapy. Um, I've got 10 years experience of working as an occupational therapist. I specialize in pediatrics, as I said. But I also have experience of working with adults um, and have a specialism in housing. So I adapt houses to be bespoke for um, disabled people. Um, being an Indian queer Muslim woman, I was one of the young people who were lost in life, as you can imagine. And I was very disengaged from the education system and was coerced into gang violence. And if it wasn't for specialist organization in the women and girls sector, I don't know where I would have been. So naturally, I'm as an adult fighting with the millions of women to end violence against women and girls, specifically black women and women of color. So therefore, I'm a trustee of a violence against women organization, as I mentioned. 
And then the other area that I'll be speaking on, uh, being a female imam at the Inclusive Mosque Initiative, um, being a queer Muslim woman, it made sense. Um, it was my path. It was the straight path for me that those of you who spiritually understand or are, are Muslim will get what this straight path is meant to be. Um, but I believe that there are many rivers to the sea. Whether you are believing of any faith or none, um, it's your faith and that's what matters. Um, and what's really important for me at the Inclusive Mosque Initiative is how we strive to truly be inclusive and that includes everyone with or without faith, any gender, any sexuality, uh, the disabled. I had a, I was a young carer for my mother who was um, a paralyzed woman, raised me as she was paralyzed and um, also suffered from mental health imbalances. So only if she had something like the inclusive mosque at that time would have been probably life-saving for her. So I'm going to move on to um, being an independent occupational therapist and for those that don't know what an occupational therapist is, our role is to rehabilitate or compensate using equipment and, that, and, and adaptations for lost skills of life, whether they are lost through accident, disease or trauma. So for, ex for example, if someone experiences a brain damage, they lose their ability to participate in occupations, which I will call as activities of daily living. And everything we do as a human being is evolved around our occupations. So that is things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, from waking up in the morning to brushing our teeth, having a shower, eating food, going out to play. Um, so for instance, if someone was to experience a brain damage, they will lose their ability to do certain things, depending on where the brain damage is. So if it was on a certain part, it will impact the ability for their right hand or both their hands to not be able to pick up a glass and bring it to their mouth. Um, or be able to brush their teeth, or be able to walk, or be able to scratch their back. Just to give you a bit of an example. Um, as I mentioned, I've worked with adults as well, but I'm specifically specializing with children. So as Latifa had mentioned in her presentation, I work with children who are on the um, considered special education need, but who also have a legal document in place, which is meant to promote needs in health, education and care. Uh, asthma, hopefully you're, um, we've sold up the, uh, sorted out the technical difficulties. Shall we uh, give it a go? Yes, let's do it. Technology, eh? <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've, I've never had a problem in that room before, but somehow, sod's law, this happens, right? I also did connect through the telephone, but it dropped me and I couldn't go back in for some reason. So I've moved closer to the router. Can you hear me clearly? Because someone did say I, they couldn't hear me on the Slack. So I'm guessing you guys can hear me. Please do, uh, viewers, comment on that. And yes, um, I hope that we can kind of, through this, be able to join with other occupational therapists. Um, as we do, we allow people to live rather than just exist and, um, there needs to be more of us just kind of getting together and that's often the key is is kind of multidisciplinary working but working together so i believe where i was last is uh talking about imagine children who are not being able to be cared for uh, on different levels in terms of health and education as well as care so i'm going to move on to the hopefully those who couldn't hear me before got a gist of what i was talking about and if you want me to recap anything, please do let me know. Um, we'll pick it up from there. I'm just mindful of the time. So considering all of the work that I do, I'm going to start off with the OT side of things and just give you a case study rather than a whole kind of um, idea of what's going on because every case is different. Um, this specific child is a 10-year-old child and um, he weighs an equivalent of 120 kgs. Just to give you an idea, he's quite tall and he's quite... Uh, is, you know, his condition means that he has rapid movements, which can hurt others. Uh, he's very cheerful and very, very expressive, though he doesn't have any verbal communication. He definitely communicates, communicates through his facial gestures and sounds. He lives with his mom and two brothers, and he's due to move to a home because his current home is no longer suitable for him. He's diagnosed with dystonic cerebral palsy, um, which consists of movements that are rapid or slow and are often painful. Involuntary movements triggered by attempts at controlled movements and involuntary movements 
occur more frequently when the person is tired, anxious or emotional. He also has global developmental and learning difficulties, has visual and auditory impairments. As I mentioned, he's nonverbal, he's full time wheelchair user and he requires assistance with all activities of daily living. So everything he does in his day, he requires assistance with. He cannot do anything on his own or independently. I managed to work with him over a period of um, a year and in that time I supported him to be able to learn to feed himself, to reach out and pick some crisps from a bowl and bring it to his mouth. It's not very controlled but for him to be able to do that is life changing. It's life changing for his entire family. And the next step for us was to be able to use utensils, adapted utensils. So looking at hand manipulation, bilateral integration, removing two hands together and potentially at some point toilet training. I usually would see him at least twice a week because I also manage his equipment, housing and um, I act as a care coordinator for his um, for his needs. So ensuring that all of the professionals are working together. If something is missing, I'm kind of that person that is like contacting the relevant person, whether that's speech and language therapist, physio, the doctors, whoever it is. Uh, just because we're a holistic profession and we often get drawn into several things that are just not, you know, directly in, in, involved in the care that we provide. Um, my work is very, very hands on. So I have to be there to kind of manipulate the body and ensure that we're doing the things that need to be done. Specifically, for instance, if the bowl is at a certain distance to him, he's not being challenged. If it's too far away, he's too challenged. If he's not supported at his core because he can't support himself, then we would put things in place so that he's core and he's able to sit up for himself. Um, some of the problems that we've had is, as I mentioned, is he needs 24 hour care and there is a huge, huge, huge shortage of carers anyway. Uh, and now even more so since uh, COVID. Carers have stopped coming in. Mum is being burnt out. Uh, understandably, she was already quite you know, tired and has her own mental health difficulties and psychological uh, struggles. Uh, but she's going towards somewhere that we are really concerned for her. And she's just one parent. So I'm just giving you an idea of, of the impact. Um, carers are unable to follow what needs to be done. So I've tried to have consultations via video um, and other colleagues have done the same. Some of the difficulties that we've been um, kind of faced with is the positioning of the device, uh, dual screen difficulties. Uh, that's just the, that's just the direct work that we're doing. But I also mentioned the stuff around, you know, carers not being able to come in or they're not being enough carers. How do we link up that? There's care agencies out there, but we're still facing the same problem that we had always faced, which is there is a huge shortage. Um, is that because of the shortage or is that because there's just too many red tapes for them? How do we manage it in a time like this? How do we ensure what kind of Amy mentioned before is how do people ensure that they are safe and are using the correct PPE? Um, I'm also managing his safety element of things. Um, so if there was a piece of equipment and he's got several specialist pieces of equipment that I would go in and kind of adjust according to his growth or his positioning that I'm supporting. And of course, I'm not able to do that. We have thought about potentially taking the chair out. But again, there's contamination difficulties. And we've just been advised by the College of Occupational Therapy is to use our own clinical judgment. And that's a heavy burden of its own anyway. But at a time like this, it's even more difficult with what we're trying to achieve. And there's a huge, huge risk of regression with that work that I did with him and with all the professionals that did with us. Um, we're afraid that he's going to regress and not be able to regain those skills at a later time. One of the other issues in this case is information sharing between professionals is generally the case in health services anyway, but working independently is even more because we just don't have access to that kind of system. Even if it's not robust, there is just nothing there for us to kind of tap into. It'd be great if we can look at something that, you know, allows us to share information according to and in line with the GDPR. I'm just going to flip over to Slack and see if there's uh, anything specific in terms of what I'm trying to say and if I have missed anything. OK, everything looks good so far. I'm going to just quickly go into the benefits of tech being in place. This can potentially, whatever we do here, can potentially be rolled out to other services. 
because I work for myself and have a close relationship with my service users, it means that I can kind of be that person. There's not much red tape around, you know, consent and all of that. It's just direct work and we can do trial and error with these um, service users and their families. A system that we can maintain independence and maintain quality of life. Um, it has been kind of known and researched into the impact of occupational therapy and the input that we provide and how it has a societal positive impact in terms of being able to increase quality of life or maintaining quality of life and rehabilitating people back into society or within their home environment. Um, apart from the obvious, there's a de there will be a decrease of harm and a reduced risk of a child going into care. I'm now going to move on to the work that I do within the violence against women and girls sector. So as I mentioned before, I'm a trustee of the Women and Girls Network. I'm also an activist with the Sisters Uncut and I support London Black Women's Project with the work that they do. Women and Girls Network is a free women only service that supports women in London who have experienced violence or are at risk of violence. They offer counselling, advocacy, advice for women and girls who have experienced gendered violence, included sexual and domestic violence. The overall aim is to promote, preserve and restore the mental health and well-being of women and girls to empower them to make a total and sustainable recovery from the experience of violence. Sisters Uncut, just briefly, is an intersectional feminist direct action collective. This means that they don't share one type of feminism, but are united by a desire to campaign for better domestic violence services that recognise the particular experience and needs of women of all backgrounds. And London Black Women's Project is committed to securing the highest level of quality service towards protecting, promoting and developing the rights and resources of women, children and families from black and minority ethnic communities. That's just a bit about the organisations. Um, these services are specifically working with women and girls, but also with a conscious effort of kind of reaching out to the more marginalised um, women and girls within the black and um, women of colour. So the kind of problem that we're facing is the obvious uh, confidentiality and privacy and the risk of violence in all forms, um, especially with COVID. You know, women are kind of being forced to be within the homes of the perpetrators and kind of have no access to any other service, any other different environment. Uh, there is an added factor of Ramadan coming up, which is the month where um, Muslims around the world will be fasting. And there is a known kind of statistic that the violence increases during this time. Um, stupid reasons, because the men tend to be hungry and short fused. And yeah, you can imagine what happens. Service users are unable to leave the house, as I mentioned, to talk to anyone because the perpetrator is at home or due to the lack of privacy within the home. We need to quickly find an alternative way to communicate with the women and girls, a chat option that is secure and can't be traced by the perpetrators who often go through phones or track what sites women have been on. And a way to alert people, the police, um, if they are in danger. Currently, there is an option to dial 999 and then press 55, but maybe something else to alert an organisation that they're already in contact with or a key worker that they're already in contact with. They're trying to deliver group work and training um, online. So any advice or tools to do that effectively and how to manage this without compromising confidentiality or the exposure of other homes. The final thing would be something that supports the sector staff who are working tirelessly and endlessly, uh, working from home during a crisis and still managing a high level of risk. Just a quick sharing from a service user um, said to me directly that she feels insecure that people in the house can listen into her sessions, even if she's trying to put the headphones on and be in a room, she can still they can still hear her. Um, and sometimes, as you know, when you've got headphones on, you really don't know how loud you're speaking until someone says you're pretty loud, you know. Um, I've had that myself. <laughs> um, she misses her face to face meditations sessions that is a lifeline for her and holding hands with her counsellor for breathing exercises and she also mentioned that Ramadan is coming up and she is kind of afraid really really afraid that in that time she's gonna not have anywhere else to go or be um, 
the breather. I'm now going to move into um, the Inclusive Mosque initiative that I am part of, which was founded in 2012 in London, UK. It's a grassroots activist organization which works towards establishing a place of worship for the promotion and practice of an inclusive Islam, which means that it's a safe space for all those who would otherwise be marginalized or excluded from the mainstream um, places of worship. It's a safe space for people with faith and no faith, all genders, sexuality, abilities, difficulties and family constructs. It centers the voices of Muslims who are women, non-binary, genderqueer, black and disabled especially. Inclusive Mosque is a lifeline for many. During COVID, the lack of safe spiritual space is going to be a detrimental for many, especially as this is a peak time and in the run-up run of Ramadan. And as you can imagine, hope, hope and faith and community is key in this climate, but it seems to be quite far from what we actually want to achieve as either individuals or as a collective. Mental health imbalances, um, the risk of people having breakdowns or potentially considering suicide and things that there I mentioned, you know, these spaces are a lifeline for people and already there are limited spaces like this. And now it's totally kind of gone off the off the radar really we are working on trying to put the sermons and prayers online but for many this will not work as it can be complicated to access but also compromises their safety in terms of who they're living with not everyone is going to agree with their way of um, following a path as you can imagine how do we monitor access how do we monitor how do we manage the space and risk of people recording pictures or attendees People are feeling unsafe in their homes and unable to access freely. <clears throat> and that is me. Like Thank I said, you so if you've got any other questions or anything that you want me to elaborate on, you can ask me directly or in the groups or however it's done. And I look forward to I look forward to the questions. I look forward to what comes out of this. And again, thank you so much for staying on and listening.